it's okay to feel all the things you feel. You can judge her, you can hate her, but I hope that mm-hmm. what we're what we're asking is is that you're brave enough to also relate to her, even if you didn't leave your kids and never ever would. You know, there are times you just need to get the fuck out. You know, for even for yeah. ten minutes. Anyone who says that's not true, I don't. I don't know. I, 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 they should call me. I had appealed to her for the rights. You know, she's, she's anonymous. So um, Elena Fronte is her pen name and we were just emailing. Um, but I, I wrote a letter telling her why I wanted to adapt it. I told her I didn't know exactly how I was going to adapt it. And I said that I wanted to direct it. I mean, the intention was always to direct it. Um, and she said, yes, you can have the rights, but the contract is void unless you direct it. And, um, you know, how did it make me feel? It, I, I think I took it as, I think it kind of stunned me, like a lot of things that like almost every interaction I've had with her, including reading her books, um, it was like this totally clear vote of confidence in me. Um, from, you know, because I don't know who she is, it was kind of felt like a, like from a kind of cosmic feminine force Mm -hmm. out of the universe, just saying, try, try this. So when I read her book, I was kind of, I was shocked and kind of woken up by how honest she was and disturbed because some of the things she's talking about are, are dark and perverse and difficult, but also comforted by the fact that someone else was writing it down, you know, that I wasn't alone thinking these things. Um, And what I said to her in the letter was, that was an incredible experience. I know I'm not alone having that experience because her books were flying off the shelves. But what if we could create that same experience of truth telling? Um, Because I think there's something inherently dramatic about telling the truth and especially about telling the truth about something taboo. What if we do that in a communal space, like a movie theater, um, and you could be, you know, maybe sitting next to your husband or your daughter or your mother. That I thought, you know, then it's not alone. Then it's, then it's really not a secret anymore. Um, and so I thought it was, it was a particularly interesting thing to, to, to make cinematic, you know, that's what I, that's what, that's what I sold her with. That's how she's not calming down. Yeah. It's been a weird day. Mm-hmm. We found her and then she lost her doll. I used to have a doll like that called Mina. Mina? Mina. Or Mini Mama, as my mother called her. You'll find it. Yeah. See tonight. Bye. Bye. When we finished the script, I I thought a couple of things. I, I gave the script to Ferrante um, to read. She didn't ask for it. She didn't really require anything of me after she gave me total freedom after she'd given me the the rights but I wanted to know what she thought she gave me two really great notes one of which I'll share with you um but one of the things she said is it's really important that Leda not be mad and I I completely agree and I I I sort of knew we were thinking in this and that was it's totally true because if she's mad I mean first of all look there's a whole um there's a whole tradition of films made by directors who probably everybody on this call loves with incredible actresses uh, about crazy women and they're great movies and we love them. But this movie is particularly not about a crazy woman because we're told if we have these unusual, aberrant, transgressive, dark, you know, despairing feelings, we're mad. And, and I, I'm, one thing I'm really trying to say is 
no, this is a, a normal part of a human experience, even though this character, of course, goes very, very far and causes herself and the people in her life a lot of pain. Um, so I needed a sane actress, like a fundamentally sane actress. And, um, and so I, yes, Olivia Coleman. And also, as you said, she does a lot of difficult things. Like she does things, she does things that cause so much pain to herself and her family that they're, it's almost unbearable. And so I wanted some humor and some levity. I wanted her to be a whole spectrum of things. Um, and again, I thought of Olivia and, um, and also I wanted a woman who has blood in her veins and is live and, uh, so anyway, I asked Olivia Coleman, I was like, what do I have to lose really? Just, just having to manage some disappointment if she says no, which I can do, <laughs> you know, and, um, and, and we met for lunch and she says I got her drunk, but we all know who got who <laughs> drunk. <laughs> but anyway, um, and uh, we, we, and she said, yes. And it was amazing. It was like one of the most amazing, amazing day. And, um, and then at that lunch, I thought it was pretty important to talk about who might play her young. I mean, this is actually almost creating one character together. And she told me about Jessie. Uh, we talked about Jessie as well as a, a couple of other actresses. And, and Wild Rose had just come out uh, in New York that weekend. And I went to see it the next day. And I thought she was absolutely incredible. I mean, I... I mean, just to be totally honest with you, I'm like tough on actresses. I, I want them to be great. You know, I'm not like, I don't just love everything, you know, I want to, but I don't always. And I was totally blown away. It's okay to feel all the things you feel. You can judge her. You can hate her, but I hope that <clears throat> what we're, what we're asking is, is that you're brave enough to also relate to her. Even if you didn't leave your kids and never ever would, you know, there are times you just need to get the fuck out, you know, for even for 10 minutes. Anyone who says that's not true, I don't, I don't know. I, 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 they should call me because I, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I do think also the, the writing and the casting and the performances of, of these these actresses playing Leda, especially, you know, they don't let you really, you, you can't really dislike them. You can't really, I hope, you know, that's at least our, been our experience. You can't really, you don't hate her. You don't, you, you may be, you may be like saying, no, no, don't do it. Or you're maybe saying, okay, that, that was too far. But I think at the end of the day, because both Jesse and Olivia give a performance that's so human and so vulnerable and so raw, you know, you can't, you can't hate them because they're just out there. They're open in front of you. So how could you really? Your name, Leda, it's very provocative. <laughs> You're thinking about the Yates. I bet you know it by heart. In Italian. Uh, tutto di colpo. La grande ale. Alpitante. Sulla ragazza. Uh, staggering girl. Mm. Sconcertante. Sì, ragazza. Sconcertante. Mm. What we are discovering is like the point of entrance and exit. Those are the things that we always like to be super aware of. Like, when is the right time to come in? When is the right time to come out? Can we come in and come out and have set up a dialogue uh, that it just kept flowing and you, you understand that whenever that happened, he, he would inform the character or the, the older Leda and the audience by, uh, by that movie. So it was always like that. I mean, in the script, it was, there were, there were specific times, but me and, and Maggie start playing with it. 
and with discovering different things and how to stretch one side and the other. And also be aware, like, are we, are we staying too long at this side? Are we completely like in awe of young Leda and are we forgetting about old Leda? So then we have to, to go back. So there was a dance, there was like a, 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 a sort of like a musicality to it that once we got it, we just followed that path. One of the first things Maggie said to me was, I love analog music, the sound of analog music on vinyl, tape, uh, pre-digital. And so that, that was something, and there's something about the texture of it, the way it's recorded, the way it sounds, that some, I think it works amazingly well on this film. And um, Maggie already put some songs in that were from the 50s and 60s, and just the sound of them just really gelled with the images and the way Fonzie was cutting it and everything. So that was a kind of a really great starting point, but it was, it was more than that because Maggie said one of the first things she said is um, she wanted it to sound like a found record. So it was like a, a vinyl record that would kind of magically somehow become the score to the film. You just put it on the record player and it would somehow work, um, which was a, a great way to start because it kind of um, it, it kind of just opened my imagination hugely because I could kind of um, write music that could uh, exist away from the film, but also come into the film and be a character in the film. And I think that was how we kind of got the ball rolling. When Maggie was describing scenes that we were going to try music with, um, she could give me a, a very deep and um, connected and often very poetic understanding of the characters and, and how they were feeling or, or what, the, what the kind of drive and the intensity of the scene was coming from that. And, and I think because she is an actress, it, an actor, it, it kind of, that is so much part of that. But also at, at times I felt, that um, she was directing me almost like I was an actor because she wanted the music to be like a character in the film. So, and, and that was something that was um, really amazing as well. If a director came to me as an actress and said, can you be more sad or can you be more sexy or whatever, lighter or something? I'd be like, I, I think I would feel insulted. Um, and, and I, I think, yes, I really do think that we interacted in a similar way to the way that I interacted with my actors. Like, well, what is it you want in the scene? How do you try to get it? It can look anyway. I don't know how it's going to look. He's a brilliant musician. I'm not about to tell him, you know, how to accomplish it. Just what do we need? Like how to go for what we need, which is very much how I think, you know, actors work. They really put us through it, huh? I thought you said you were pregnant with your first. I am. What were your daughters like when they were little? Were, were they like this willful little creature? I don't want to say, I can't remember much, actually. Oh, no, you can't forget anything about your own children. Is that your experience? I just mean, did your daughters give you a hard time when they were little? I just don't remember. You okay? She doesn't remember. I was very tired. So, excuse me. Sorry. Look, don't bother buying another doll. It won't make any difference. You'll find it. Probably the first thing I really did as a director, um, was to say, pandemic or not, New Jersey is wrong. And I'm sorry, but we have to go back to the drawing board here. And it was really amazing to me to see how, you know, because I spent my life as an actress and an actress with an idea that cracks everything open is often considered a problem, you know? And I was anticipating much more resistance. And when I came and said, look, artistically, I actually, I, I, I need to say what I felt all along, this isn't right. Everyone kind of went, okay, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I realized it's a very different job being a director. And, um, and every time from then on that I had that feeling, this is not quite right. Uh, I see everyone's rushing in that direction, but it isn't gonna work. I, I came to see that it was reliable, that feeling. I, I learned from previous directors um, 
I've worked with directors who were brutal um, and not interested in me and the other actors I was working with. And I've worked with some directors now and then who were full of love and uh, really curious about the people they were working with. And there's no question to me that my work as an actress with the second kind of director was far, far better. Um, and I think a really a huge part of being a director, I really believe this, is um, choosing to work with people who you are actually curious about and you actually respect and then loving them. So that I learned from a couple of people who did that to me. I think in some ways in this film, I, I constructed it as a thriller. I used a classic cinematic language. And then in between the words, the cinematic, you know, words, I felt free to express myself. But I'm sort of curious to know what happens if I don't lean on a classic cinematic language, like what my voice would be. Mm -hmm. um, and if I can feel entitled to like take this really make the space to find out 